We'll be reading from God's Word from Revelation chapter 5. Our scripture for this morning and our sermon will be from this passage, this chapter in the book of Revelation chapter 5. I'll be reading all of chapter 5. In chapter 4, um, John the Evangelist, he had a, a glimpse, a vision of the throne and many of the um, persons that are identified in chapter 5, it was in chapter 4 that they appeared. But there's an added reality in chapter 5, the appearance of the scroll. And let us then begin reading in verse 1 of Revelation 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne." And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his own word and the preaching also shortly. And before we... I'm thankful for Jesus. And the reason we have this as the little subtitle of this morning's theme, Who is Worthy? Well, the answer in our text is that the Lord Jesus is the worthy one. And this little phrase, I'm thankful for Jesus, I do believe might be the most said phrase among Christian families around Thanksgiving season, especially from our little children. Little children, how many times when we go around the table or if you as a family and your family worship around the season of Thanksgiving and visiting many homes and being with many families, I've seen this is something quite, quite universal in the Christian family life that... Around Thanksgiving, we go around and ask, we'll say one thing for which you're thankful. 
And so often, and it's such a blessed thing to hear from little boys and little girls, and also from fathers and mothers and young men and, and women, but so often the little children will say, well, I'm thankful for Jesus. And we should never, ever stop repeating that. Um, sometimes as we go around, isn't it true that we think, well, I'm, I, I know I'm thankful for many other things, but I, I need to say I'm thankful for Jesus. And when, when a few people have said it around the line, usually we say, well, I'm thankful for Jesus and also for my family and also for my job. And, and I think to say I'm thankful for Jesus is, is really always the basic thing. And I have chosen this passage, this this Thanksgiving morning, because it is a passage that helps refuel in our hearts the reality of why we are so thankful for Jesus and how we should continue to be saying we're thankful for Jesus and being vocal about it, not just during Thanksgiving season, but throughout all our lives. Because what this chapter singles out is this unique and exclusive reality regarding every single person who has ever lived upon this earth, that there is no one like the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no one for whom we are to be more thankful than the Lord Jesus Christ upon this earth. And when, when I say this, I'm of course including in this the reality that we're thankful for the triune God. But see this reality, like Jesus himself said, no one can come to the Father except through me. See, we would never even know the Father and be able to be thankful to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. It hadn't been for the Lord Jesus having come and been this worthy one that from, from every creature in heaven on earth was found none but him. And so this is what we hope to do as we go through this passage, just just answering this question as the text does, who is worthy? And we, we begin by seeing that none was found to be worthy. And, and in this first point, we, we will set the scene as John the Evangelist was seeing in heaven. Um, he had seen, first of all, this throne that was there um, in heaven. And in chapter 4, like I said, is where we see this throne being, being declared. In verse 4 it says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. It's, it's astonishing to see how brief and how without too many details we find this one on the throne. Um, and also in chapter 4, in chapter 5, we, we also see this throne being singled out um, and in verse 7 it says and he came and took the book of out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne so there is this throne in heaven and this is the place from where God is ruling heaven and earth and and we need to understand here revelation has a lot of elements that are figurative God being spirit and occupying the whole universe, it is not for us to think that he is limited to a, a, a chair, even as big as that chair may be, this throne. But this, this is to illustrate his ruling power, his way of governing over heaven and earth. The Lord Jesus will come and take the scroll from the hand of the one who sits upon it. So that's to show God. And, and, and he visualizes. And this is probably why the mystery, why much is not described about him who sits on the throne. Because it's not for us to envision him as a, as a human being necessarily. Because he isn't. God does not have a body like men. He is a spirit. But this is to help us understand. It is spoken in ways that we, even as little children, can, can capture the reality. Yes, a king rules from a throne. And, and, and so this is in vision, and it's to help us understand um, the reality that this world is completely under the control of a sovereign God. There's a throne. And then we hear something about the courtiers. Because if that is the throne, then that is the court. And the people who are on the court that are more described here are these 24 elders and also these four beasts. 
or also called living creatures, as the word beast can be translated. The 24 elders, um, this seems to be clearly a connection with, with humanity and those who are human. Some have, because we, we do find the reality of, of the foundation of the temple being 12, relating to the 12 tribes and 12, the apostles. Some consider this as a, a way to symbolize the saints of the Old Testament, the saints of the New Testament. These 24 elders are, in a sense, a, a, a typifying of every single person who is in heaven and who shall be in heaven. And then we have the four beasts, and they stand for the angels. They, they are um, described in several other places. We find these living creatures um, also um, in Ezekiel. And they are here um, in, in such a, such a intense presence because it says in, in chapter 4, verse 6, that they were in the midst of the throne and round about the throne, these four beasts. In Ezekiel, we find them as the ones who are even sustaining the throne. And the whole idea we have is God, as he rules, he uses his angels. And what they do upon this earth is literally God ruling upon this earth. You see this presence. I mean, how can you describe these beings who are in the midst of the throne and even at the same time round about the throne? It's, it's a way of describing their presence just everywhere. And, and, and they are the agents of God's sovereign rule upon this earth. So the throne, the courtiers, courtiers, and then we find also the Holy Spirit's presence, the Father's presence, we could say, upon this very throne. But we also see the Holy Spirit's presence in ways that also evokes the, the, the mystery that you can't pinpoint, but yet he is present. Um, in chapter 4, we find both a visible manifestation of the Spirit as well as an audible manifestation of the Spirit. In verse 5 of chapter 4, we read, And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And, and boys and girls, even though it says seven spirits, it, it is, again, not for us to envision Seven as if there's seven Holy Spirits. That's one way of describing the wholeness and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, as the number seven always indicates. We will find the presence of the Holy Spirit, not just intricately connected to the, to the throne itself, because did you hear how um, all of this, all of the lamp, of the light and the fire burning and the sound was proceeding it was before the throne. See how connected to the throne. And then in chapter 5 that we read, we, we find this presence of the Spirit upon the Lamb Himself. When the Lamb was presented in chapter 6, it says that stood a Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So we have the Holy Spirit present here as well um, in a visible way and also in an audible way with this thunderings and, and the voices that proceed before the throne. And then a fourth, a fourth item in all of this that John is seeing is that sea of glass that stands before the throne. And the sea of glass, of course, here is described as something very calm and serene before the throne of God. And, and you could call this the realm of God. He, if, if God is upon this throne and what is preceding him, what comes before him, is what you could say the result of his rule. Everything is calm. Everything is pure. Everything is solemn. Everything is fine. Everything is okay, you could say. Um, and, and this sea of glass has been revealed in different ways to different people. To Moses, in Exodus, we find the description of the presence of God and then before him this pavement work of sapphire stone as it is the body of heaven in his clearness. You see, it's a description also of something very pure and perfect and smooth. And then to Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 1.22, 
When it speaks of the presence of God, then it speaks of, of what is there before him. And, and, and here, Ezekiel seems to be below all of this because it says that the color of the terrible crystal stretched for over their heads above. And so here it was in the appearance of a crystal. And, and boys and girls, you've seen crystal. It's always clean and clear. It is like glass. It is smooth. And so some see here a, a symbol of, of the purity and the sanctity of God. And, and the, what, what you could see here, the parallels, is this. Yes, here on this earth... Our seas are very turbulent. And when you think about the whole world, there is wars and rumors of wars and, and famine and sadness and sorrow and a lot of turbulence. But as God rules upon this earth, there's not a single surprise for him. There's not a single problem that is really a problem to him. There is no anxiety in heaven. There is no worries. It is a calm. It is a sea of glass. Because even though here everything rages, it's, it is because of sin and we're not understanding why certain things happen. But they all have their purpose. And from the viewpoint of heaven, everything is calm. So the throne, the Holy Spirit, the courtiers, the realm. And in the midst of all this, chapter 5 brings in right, right at the very beginning this reality of a book or a scroll. A scroll that is written within and on the outside and inside, and it's sealed with seven seals. But in, in verse 2, there's this angel that comes forth, and he proclaims, he's a strong angel, and he proclaims with a loud voice this question, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And, and there's this problem introduced. No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And, and boys and girls, if, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, well, but, but so this angel couldn't open. Oh, that's probably OK and, and understood. But what about God himself on the throne and the Holy Spirit certainly could open? See, this angel is speaking in behalf of God. God, of course, has the authority. He's the one who wrote what is in there. It is, it is his decrees. He has the authority. The whole idea is beyond God and the Spirit, outside in the whole universe, there's not one single human, no single being. See, no one whom God has created, no angel, however powerful as he is, and no human, however holy he has ever lived, can Open this book. See, no man, there was no one. See, it brought this reality of an impossibility. And in verse 4, John reacts with this. And we, and we see here how John was so in the midst of all this vision. For him, it wasn't now a dream. It was something very real. Remember, he was taken in the Spirit to see heaven. And he is now so part of all that is happening. And he's had so much revealed that now he's, as, as it were, like in a road without, without any continuation. He's, he's got a roadblock, as it were, but in heaven. And so this means that whatever's in that scroll, he will not know. If there's blessings in that scroll, it will not be had. If there are judgments in that scroll, he will not know about what those judgments are. There's, there's a sense of a sadness because he cannot know what is in there and so he weeps in verse 4 and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book neither to look thereon now now to help us also understand a little better his sadness it's it's important that we ourselves put ourselves in the midst of this um, vision you see, as noble as the 24 elders were, the Bible describes them dressed with, with white and with crowns of gold. So these are very noble beings. They, they are people who are in heaven. They can't open the scroll. They're not worthy. And then as majestic and as awe-striking these four living creatures are, they have eyes everywhere pointing to the, 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 the reality that God sees everything and sends His angels who know what's going on. They are not caught by surprises because of who sends them. 
and the power that they have, they are not worthy. They don't have in themselves the qualification to open the scroll, the seals. And it's this very question that magnifies the worthiness of the worthy one. And just one last thing before we go to our second point. It's very possible that then what struck the heart of John and what should strike each of our hearts is the reality that John also was acknowledging, I'm not worthy either. Even as privileged as he was of every single human, think of the exclusivity of John. Saul never, Paul never saw to this extent of heaven. He did see elements of the glories of heaven, such mysteries he was not able to write. But we don't know that he saw all of this that John saw. Peter never saw all of this before he went there. Moses never saw all of this. Ezekiel never saw it to this degree. Revelation stands as a book of, of what is revealed, astonishing glory and majesty and wonder. At one point, John falls as if dead in the presence of glorious God. And God is saying, John, you're not worthy either. You're also not worthy to be the one to unseal the scroll. There are commentators that, that deal with the fact that possibly John here was hit with the reality, I'm unworthy. As worthy as I am to come to have a sight of heaven, I am not worthy to open the scroll. And one point of application here, beloved, is our hearts will be so much more full of gratitude to Jesus if we acknowledge the worthiness of our own hearts. It's striking to think, beloved, isn't it, that everything that really comes from us, our own creation, if God leaves us to ourselves, there's nothing to be thankful for. Because when you think of the good things that you and I could do, it is all the fruit of the Spirit in us. A simple kindness shown to someone else, it's the Spirit through you. The forgiveness that you would give to someone else, it is the Spirit through you. The love, the patience, the gratitude. See, when you say, thank you, Mom, for this meal, this heart of gratitude is something that comes from God, from the grace of God. And even in the heart of an unbeliever, when he has an expression of gratitude and they can do good things as well, and it's all through the common grace of God. And sadly, an unbeliever, because he doesn't do it for the glory of God, it is never any of those things completely, purely, evangelically, biblically considered good at all. You stop to think of that. Without Jesus, you and I can't even be thankful. It's not that there's nothing to be thankful for. Our eyes just can't see it. And, and that's why there can be so much complaining, and that's why there can be so much anger, so much evil, so much jealousy, so much envy, so much murder. All of those things are the fruit of the flesh. See, the things that proceed from us as humans alone, if God were to say, fine, you don't want me to be a part of your life, I will leave you to yourself. And then what are the fruits of the flesh? It is anger and murder and adultery and discord. And backbiting and complaining. That's who you and I are. Without the grace of God. Nothing to be thankful for. Unworthiness. And even the best of men. Here we could say John is now the last man who has a worthiness about him. It is a lot like Isaiah who was in essence the best of men in the days of his, that he lived. But when he had a sight of the glory of God, he had to put his hand on his mouth and say, woe is me. He was realizing I am unworthy in the sight of the worthy one. I realize my unworthiness. I dwell in the midst of people who sin and 
and I have sinned so greatly, Lord. Woe is me. And, and John is in essence doing the same thing. He's being caught with the thought, I was invited to heaven, but I'm not worthy. And not even these 24 elders who, who have crowns of gold and white raiment, they, they look like angels, they're here in heaven. And, and these four beasts who are so glorious and magnificent, and I'm here part of now this retinue, and there's none worthy. And so he, he bursts out and cry. When it says he wept much in the Greek, it is that. It's not that he's just crying a little. It's not even just sobbing. It is just bursting out into loud weeping. And boys and girls, I, I don't know if... Um, this is the, the sad thing. As we grow up into adulthood, we are embarrassed to cry too loud. So we don't, we don't cry like sometimes you do when you get hurt. But you, you're so familiar with that, isn't it? As soon as you get hurt, you stump your toe, you hit something, you don't mind crying out loud. It's, it's, it's the best way to, to get help as fast as you can. And we as adults might not even remember the last time we cried out loud. But this is how John is crying. And this just sets the tone to our second point, the worthy one. And we don't know how long John was there crying. It said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. See, there, he, he wasn't even able, maybe he, he understood that scroll was there, maybe by a very tiny glimpse or by what was communicated, but he couldn't even keep just gazing upon it until verse 5. And one of the elders, so right here you catch a glimpse that those elders who are sitting, they, they're not just worshiping. Sometimes they're singing, sometimes they're speaking, and they'll become the one to speak to John to explain what's happening. So one of those elders saith unto me, Weep not. You don't have to keep crying. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And beloved, this, this, is, this is the cornerstone, you could say, of this sermon that I am praying would apply to our hearts where every Thanksgiving season, when we say, I'm thankful for Jesus, we would be renewed with joy and gladness that truly we are thankful for Jesus. Because if it weren't for Jesus, we wouldn't know to be thankful we wouldn't be able to be thankful, even though there would still be a God who deserved all our gratitude. There is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who prevailed. The word prevailed means that he conquered. He's a conqueror. There's a victor. There's someone who is qualified to open the book. And the first description of this man is that he is a lion. He is a lion. Um, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you'll remember how Jacob, when he was blessing his sons, he made an allusion to, a be, to, to his son Judah of being a lion. And that was already foreseeing the reality of a royal dynasty in the line of Judah. And King David came from the line of Judah. And, and when David was born, there was, you could say, part of the fulfillment. Well, he did become a king, and he was like a lion. Um, you'll remember how he killed a lion with his bare hands. So, so King David was like a lion because he killed lions. He, he killed bears, at least one that we know. He killed a giant and he prevailed over the onslaughts of Saul. And, <clears throat> and David did so many things that were very lion-like. But there's none in this whole world as, as brave and as bold as David was as a lion. There's none more lion-like than the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. He trampled over enemies that were greater than mere lions and bears, or even Goliaths. The Lord Jesus trampled over his enemies while his hands were nailed to the cross. Boys and girls, look at the comparison. David, like a lion, killed a lion with his bare hands, but his hands were free. The Lord Jesus' hands were nailed to the cross, and while 
It was nailed. He was crushing the head of the serpent. Much bolder and much more dangerous than any lion that has ever lived. The Lord Jesus had been scourged by Pilate. His blood was being shed. And he had a a crown of thorns upon his head. And he was there destroying Enemies that no man could ever destroy. He was trampling over death itself. He was was killing the very sting of death by receiving sins upon him and making it where sins would no longer be able to sin. You and me, anyone who trusts in him, death is vanquished because Jesus killed it. He conquered death. He destroyed sin. He crushed Satan's head. Like a lion, he pounced upon his enemy. He came upon them unsuspected. There's this reality that happened. Satan Satan didn't want to let Jesus go to the cross. He knew the cross was dangerous. He understood sacrificial system. And yet, when he saw that people hated Jesus and wanted to kill Jesus, it's as if Satan was now under the stupor of his own pride. And it was unsuspected that on the cross, his head would be crushed. And he then was wanting him to die. And and of course, you can imagine the the enemies of Christ in the realm of darkness, how they, they couldn't but rejoice that he's being slain. But that's when the lion was, as it were, pouncing upon his enemy, who was now unsuspected, drunken by their malice. And so his head was crushed. And he was victorious, even though people thought he was defeated. Sin was atoned for. Death was killed. Satan was silenced. Every single soul who hears of the Lord Jesus Christ and bows before him as your king and trusts in him and repents of your sin because you even understand my sin is what made him suffer soul. What do I want anything to do with sin? Forgive me, Lord, for my sin. You are conquered too. See, he conquered a people. He conquered a kingdom. And all willingly, not a single one comes by force. You know, maybe you've seen pictures of these kings after they made raids over towns and they're bringing all the people that they conquered and they're all shackled, one shackled with a chain to another, to another, to another. And they're all going now to be subjects of that king in his realm. And and you could say, well, he conquered a people, but they're all going against their will. They would do anything to break those chains and go back to their old village. But... Every single true believer is in the kingdom because God made us willing servants. We're not chained to each other. and We're not chained to God, even though we call ourselves slaves of Jesus with a smile in our faces. We are willing servants. Men and women, boys and girls. See, he conquered us. He conquered a bride. See, even there in the vision of a bride, you see the willingness. He has said, I want you and I free you from your slavery to that old master to be my queen, to be my, my, my bride, to be my wife. And we are like that bride that says yes to the Lord Jesus' request for marriage. The Lord Jesus conquered a people. For the Lord Jesus, there's not a single loose end. There's no unresolved problem. There's no enigma that's too hard. There's there's also no rebel who's been unattended. Just for this brief moment, I spoke of how he conquered a people. But all who do not desire to bow to King Jesus, all who who reject him, they are conquered too. And this is, the, this is the sad reality how those who die without Christ and never bow before Him as their Lord and Savior, they're still conquered. There's no penitent sinner forgotten. There's no rebel that will ultimately be unattended. There's no devil in this world who will ever be unharmed. So the lion is Jesus, 
in his might, in his valor, in his courage and power. But as soon as the elder told about this qualified one, this worthy one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, this was in speech. This is what was declared about him. But when John took a gaze upon him, it says in verse 6, and I beheld and lo, and that little word lo is very important because John is saying, and I looked, but, but as I looked, but behold, he didn't see a lion. He didn't see someone bold and brave and majestic and, and glorious as I just described. This, this whole first description that I have made is merely from what the elder told John that would be the reality. But when he saw in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. So a lion who's also a lamb. And beloved, not only a lamb and not a lion at the sight, but a lamb as it had been slain. A slain lamb. And here, something that's so hard to even describe A lamb that has been slain is a dead lamb, and yet he is there, and soon we'll see him grabbing. So this is is a living lamb, and yet one who seems to have been killed. It's not only the idea that he has some bruises. It's one that was dead and now is alive. You may have seen a dead lamb, and this is like a dead lamb, and yet standing. And beloved, there's probably not a greater contrast And what we say this is, is not a true contrast. Well, it is a contrast, but it's not a contradiction. It is a paradox. It's it's wonderful that literature has words for everything to help us describe things. A paradox is an apparent contradiction. It looks like something that is contrary to the other. It looks like an impossibility. Boys and girls, can you ever imagine looking at a lion and thinking it's a lamb? Anyone who's seen a lamb knows that it's not a lion. But this man was called a lion. And when John sees him, he's a lamb. So how do we explain this? See, the the lamb, and as it had been slain, is the picture of defeat. That, that's a slain animal. It is an innocent, meek one, a small and weak one. So a lion attacks while a lamb retreats, and a lion is strong. A lamb is weak, and a lion is large, and a lamb is small. It's not even a ram. It is a lamb, which is a baby. Sometimes a lamb can be called up to about a year old, but a ram could be bigger and bolder, still smaller than a lion. But it's not even a ram. It's a lamb, and, and a lion is a hunter. And a lamb is food. This is a great contrast. contrast. A conquering lion is the worthy one. But when John sees him, he's a slain lamb. And it's this very paradox that really explains the gospel. And sadly, it's why so many people don't understand or grasp the gospel. They, they reject the very premise that could save them. Now, how many in history have said, you're Jesus? You want me to believe you're Jesus who died on the cross? And so they scorn and they mock the Savior who alone is the worthy one, as John is seeing, who could save them. yes. My Savior is the one who died on the cross. And that is what makes him a conquering lion. The fact that he was a slain lamb. Because see, the, what explains all of this is what he was conquering. He was not conquering what all these other powerful and great rulers want to conquer. He wasn't conquering more land and he wasn't conquering palaces and he wasn't interested in in, in area and lakes and and, and exits into uh, seas so that he could have his ocean to go and attack other continents. That's not what Jesus was conquering. 
You couldn't do that from a cross, and you couldn't do that with nails on your hand. You couldn't do that with scourges, with whiplash, with the spit of men. The Lord Jesus was conquering a people, as we said. He was conquering a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. He was conquering a bride. And what did he have to conquer them from? He had to conquer them from sin, from death, and from hell. This is one level. And there's a deeper level of what he had to conquer them from. And it's because of sin, death, and hell. He had to conquer them from the very wrath of God. Because of sin in your heart and mind, beloved. God's wrath stands upon us, and rightly so, because He's just and righteous. How how can He not be showing wrath where there is sin? He would not be just if He allowed sin to go unpunished. He was conquering us from the very wrath of God. And He couldn't do that as a lion. It, it, would be, it would be blasphemy. It would be sacrilege if a lion were to be on the altar. It was an unclean animal. It wasn't a matter of being a lion that would just literally physically go and kill people everywhere. No. Jesus, this is why Jesus looked at Pilate and let him live. Looked at Caiaphas and was silent before him. He wasn't there to be with a man, with a lion, as it were, with a sword, to conquer them in this human way by which you just slain people and conquer people. No, he was conquering a people unto himself in a way that only a lamb could do. Because only a lamb was an unblemished animal. Only a lamb was meek. Only a lamb was willing. Even there, beloved, there's a a symbol. Try to kill a lion, and he's not going to want to. Try to kill a lamb. It's like it welcomes you to do it. When I was studying agriculture, and I was told this by my teachers, they, they literally tell you these things. And you, learn, you, you slay any other kind of animal, and they complain a lot. A lamb doesn't. It, it kind of welcomes being slain. And I, and I do believe it's by design that God made lambs this way, to typify further that the Lord Jesus went to the cross as a lion in his courage and as a lion in his boldness, as a lion in his power and in his strength, but as a lamb in his purity, as a lamb in his willingness, as a lamb in his meekness. And so he is worthy. He is the worthy one. And we we could say so much, but I want to go to our third and last point, worshiping the worthy one. See, as, as he is singled out in verse 7, has this glorious moment. It's, again, amazingly nondescript in showing the one sitting on the throne. It's certainly purposeful because our, our eyes are even prohibited to know the details and, and the wonder that would be upon him who sits on the throne. But verse 7, it's, it's just a line. It says, and he came. So this is the Lord Jesus, the Lamb, who a lion and a lamb. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So this would be a way to, to show in a figurative way God the Father. He takes the scroll from his hand. So here we have this reality, beloved. You see how the theologians struggle in, in the best ways to say this is a triune God. The Holy Spirit echoing forth out of the Lord Jesus. When, when he's described, the Lord Jesus, not only as a lamb, he is showing an element of humility, but he has these seven horns and seven eyes. And this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit upon the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit did not dwell him perfectly and wholly. And, and so here's the Spirit, here's the Father, here's the Son. Each one is a person. They are distinct. 
and yet they're one God. And what happens when that moment occurs? Heaven echoes forth into worship. And the way that it happens is in waves. And we have in verse 8, um, the beginning of it. And, and when he had taken the book, we, f- we find the four beasts and the f- four and twenty-four elders. In their reaction, they just fell down before the Lamb. Now, here, beloved, is, is a blessed principle when, uh, point when we think of this worship. There is a glimpse here, we can truly understand this, where you are present in this very worship if you have ever prayed by faith in Jesus and your request has ever been that God's name be hallowed and that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven even that his kingdom would come and that His will would be done. You can be certain that those prayers, every prayer of every believer for the glory of God upon this earth, for the salvation of souls, for the salvation of your own soul, for the forgiveness of your sins, they are here in verse 8. When these 24 elders fall down before the Lamb, it says, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odor, which are the prayers of the saints. Your prayers in heaven. Here, God is not defining What specific petitions? It's just the prayers of the saints. And that's why I do believe we can certainly put it in this category. If you've ever prayed, Lord, that thy name would be glorified on earth. Lord, that Jesus would come back. Lord, that my sins would be forgiven. Lord, that my Savior, that that my neighbor would be saved. That my children would know thee. Lord, that thy will would be done upon this earth. You can be certain these are the prayers that are there before the throne of God in this moment where John sees the Lamb taking the book and they all fall before Him and pray. And verse 9 is the first flow of praise. They sang this new song singing, Thou art worthy to take the book. See, why is He worthy? Because, and to open the seals thereof, for Thou was slain. The very fact that you died, the very fact that you were a sacrifice, because what did that do? And has redeemed us to God by the blood of, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. See, these are the 24 elders. They, they are representing believers who, who were saved by this very blood, and now they're in heaven, and they're seeing the effects of this blood, and they're realizing more, millions of other people will be saved, and they cannot but worship the Lamb. Beloved, when we go back home around our tables and we say, what are we thankful for? May our hearts be full of joy to say, I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for the worthy one. Why are we thankful for Jesus? Boys and girls, don't don't ever forget this. Because he died on the cross. Isn't it amazing to think we're thankful for someone who died? We're never thankful for death, but we're thankful for his. Because by dying, he was the lion lion conqueror, conquering a people willingly. This very day, if you are not yet saved, but if you would bow before King Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I believe there is no other name upon this earth by which man may be saved. I believe. I believe you're the only worthy one. I believe thou art the Savior of all people. Thou art the only Savior worthy because thou hast died for sinners. My sins were dealt with by thee. The very wrath of God will pass over me because it passed through thee. Anyone who prays in faith, asking for this Savior, is conquered by Him. And you can be certain that these very prayers are in verse 9. 
verse 8 of Revelation. See, boys and girls, did you ever think that your prayers could be in the Bible? But they are. When you pray that his kingdom would come, when you pray that you're, you would be saved. And I just want to end with the, with the other flows of worship. In verse 11, he says that he beheld and he heard the voice of many angels. So now it's not just the four beasts anymore representing all of them. We have these angels that are coming now like a host of heaven and round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them. And this is in the millions. John says it was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands in verse 12 saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. See, the fact he was slain is why he's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then verse 13 adds every single creature that there is, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. See, God the Father, God the Son, and all of this through God the Holy Spirit is worshipped forever. And the four beasts said amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. May God bless each and every one this Thanksgiving day as we are thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is worthy. Have you found him to be so? Beloved, this is the confession of every believer. And we need to, don't you, under, don't you believe and agree with me? We need to be refreshed with this reality. Sometimes we say, I'm thankful for Jesus. And we're, we're still thinking at a head level. We're not really thinking it in a, an experiential level. And we're not feeling as it were while we say, I'm thankful. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you can be thankful for Jesus today. You can be thankful that this could be the day that you bow before him as king of your life, crowning you with salvation because he is willing to save sinners. Are you willing to call him the worthy one? the worthy to save your soul and prepare you for the great day that we see him come in all his glory. Let us pray. Our gracious, glorious God, how thankful we are for the Lord Jesus Christ, the lion lamb who went to the cross, who boldly took the onslaughts of men of devils, and even, Lord, thy wrath, so that we could be thy people, made willing in the day of thy glory. We pray, Lord, that thou would graciously make other sinners willing as well to bow to the Lordship of Christ. Help, Lord, all of us as believers as well to be renewed in our thoughts when we say, I'm thankful for Jesus. We pray, Lord, this Thanksgiving Day that Thou would bless all our, all our families as we come together, Lord, with the blessed joy of family life. Bless, Lord, our prayers as we are thankful for our nation. We are thankful, Lord, that there are still so many in this very nation who proclaim Thy name, who confess Christ and we pray, Lord, that Thou would graciously bless Thy word, that we, may, we, that we may be thankful, Lord. I am with a petition now, Lord, for further gratitude, that we may still be thankful for a universal and even certainly, please, Lord, a national level revival that would turn hearts of millions and millions of people to King Jesus, that they would know this Lamb, who is also a lion, that they would trust in him and bow their knees to Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.